If you're color grading in DaVinci Resolve and you're trying to get your footage that looks like this to look a little bit more like this, then you may have heard of the Color Space Transform tool. But one of the big questions that people have when they start using Color Space Transform is where to put it in their node workflow. Is it best to put it at the start, at the end, maybe somewhere in the middle? So in this video, we're gonna take a practical look at what a Color Space Transform is, how you might want to incorporate it into your color grading, and I'm gonna try and teach you how you can decide where the best place to put that Color Space Transform is. Secure the cup, and let's get into it. Okay, so we're here in DaVinci Resolve 18. I've got this shot of me standing in front of some greenery. We've got lots of different colors on the color card, as well as brightness, because we've got the sky in the background all the way down to the black on the color card and my black hoodie. I shot this in S-Log3 on my Sony Alpha 1, and we're going to demonstrate what happens when you use a color space transform in different places in your node graph. A couple of quick housekeeping things, because I know someone will probably ask in the comments if we go to color management in our preferences or in our project settings. Right now I've got the timeline color space as Rec 709 Gamma 2.4 as well as the output color space as the same. This is pretty standard for SDR color grading and delivery. You can technically use a wider color space on your timeline if you want something like DaVinci Wide Gamut Intermediate. That's what I've been using a lot lately. But just to keep it simple for the purposes of explaining what color space transforms do and where to put them, I'm gonna keep it at Rec 709 Gamma 2.4 for now. So first things first, what is a color space transform doing? Well, like I said before, I shot this clip in S-Log3 S-Gamut3 Cine, which is a picture profile that you can use on Sony cameras. If we take Color Space Transform and apply it on a node here in our color tab, we get these options up in the top right. And so what we wanna do is choose the input color space that matches the way that the clip was shot. So I'm gonna click on here, I'm gonna hit S, so it brings us down to the S's and then find Sony S-Gamut3 Cine. And when I click this, you'll notice that the colors will slightly shift in our image. Now I'm going to do the same for input gamma. So we've changed the color space. Now time to change the gamma. I'm going to hit S again. I'm going to choose Sony S-Log3 for the gamma and you'll notice it shift again. Now the reason that it's shifting already is because our output color space and output gamma are set to use timeline. And if you remember from before, I set my timeline color space to Rec. 709 Gamma 2.4. So it's already automatically setting our output color space as Rec. 709, our output gamma as Gamma 2.4. But just to be safe, I'm gonna go in here and choose Rec. 709 and Gamma 2.4. Absolutely nothing happened, but just in case, it's nice to put that in there in case you forgot to set something up, it'll be a big clue for you to go back and fix it. For now, we're just gonna leave all the other settings at default in our color space transform. And as you can see, we've now gone from our flat log footage to a more regular looking image. So what is that color space transform doing? Well, it's taking the input color space and gamma that we gave to it, so Sony S-Log3 and Sony S-Gamut3 Cine, and it's converting it using a bunch of math and stuff that it has all built into the color space transform to get a more accurate representation of what the image is going to look like in the end. Because we don't want to deliver this, we want to deliver something a little bit closer to this. Now, there are a handful of different ways that we can get from one color space or one gamma to another one. If we're working in a Rec. 709 timeline like we are, technically we could go in and we could just start messing with a curve and we could crank up some saturation and we could try and get things as close as possible to a regular looking image. But at that point, we're just guessing, we're going off of what we can do with our eyes. If we want, we can also find a LUT that's built to do this. So for example, right here, I've got this Sony S-Log3 S-Gamut3 Cine 2709 LUT. I can slap that on there and it does a pretty good job. While using a LUT can do a pretty good job in some situations, in this case, it's not clipping anything or having any problems with it, but it's only ever going to be so accurate just based on the way that LUTs work. Whereas if you use a color space transform, you're gonna get a more accurate result as well as less chance of accidentally clipping out any colors, highlights, shadows, any of those kinds of things. So we've decided that we're going to use a color space transform to get the most accurate representation of transforming from S-Log3 into Rec. 709. The question is, where do we put it in our node graph? Where do we put it in our workflow? And I hate to say it, 
but really there's no right answer. There's just understanding what is going to happen when you put it in certain places and then using that to your advantage. And I will give you a couple of examples of why you might want to put it in different places. And the basic premise of this is understanding how nodes work. So on the left here, we've got our input. On the right, we've got our output. The input is basically the clip as it was when it got imported into our software. The output is the clip as we see it after all the color grading. So right now the input is going from there into our first node where I have the color space transform applied. Then it's coming from the output of node one going to our output and that's what we're seeing. So anything that happens in this middle area, that's the color grading that we're doing. And then the output is what we see in the end. Then if we were to right click on this node and hit add node, add serial or hit option S, it'll add a node after that first node. So now I've got node one going into node two. So anything that's happening in node one, node two doesn't know. It's, it's not aware of what's going on here. Node two is basically just seeing the image as if this was the original image. Let me give you a quick example. So if we go over to our grayscale here, this is going from 100% black all the way to 100% white. And you can see our graph here is a perfect line on the waveform. So node one is seeing exactly this. So in node two, if I were to go into my log wheels and I crank up shadow, you can see that what shadow does is it creates this arch and it moves up everything that's below that kind of 384 line with a little bit of a bend there. But if I were to go back to node number one and crank up my offset, so let's just quickly disable node two. I'm gonna go and crank up my offset. So now you can see that line, there is nothing below that 384 line. When I enable node two, nothing's going to happen because now the input of node two, which is the image coming from node one, I moved everything up above the point where node two was performing any kind of actions. So the order in which you have your nodes is really important here. Node two is always seeing what's coming from node one and the tools that we're using are reacting in a certain way according to that. So let's grab our original image here and we're gonna do a little experiment to see what happens if we make adjustments before the color space transform versus what happens when we make them after. To create another node before, I'm gonna hit Shift S. So that just made a little node before the color space transform. So right now it's dead smack in the middle. First things first, we're gonna go into node one and I'm gonna grab my offset and I'm going to crank that up. All that offset does is it moves everything up and down equally. So it's basically as if you fully exposed higher. So I'm kind of like fixing my image or my exposure to start with. So you can see down in the waveform that everything is moving up and down. So let's say I just wanted to re-expose my image so that it's a little bit more in the middle there. And then I will enable my color space transform. And I went a little too far with it. Something like that is probably good. Now, if I were to take this exact same primary offset move that I did, just exposing it higher and put that after the color space transform, what do you think happens? We can do this by holding down command and dragging this first node over to the third one. This is just gonna switch node number one and node number three. Now, as you can see, it changed. So that was before this is after. Why did we get a different result? It goes back to the order of the nodes. This color space transform knows to change S-Log3 footage into Rec. 709. That's because that's what we told it to do. And since that's not a linear move, it's going to include contrast curves and saturation and all sorts of different things going on in there. It needs to look at what's coming into it and it's going to adjust accordingly. So like we saw with the grayscale example, anything that's in a certain portion of the image image is going to react in a certain way. So when we moved that around before the color space transform, it reacted differently to the image because we had changed the image going into it. Now take a look down at the waveform here. I'm still on the node after the color space transform. When I move the offset, it does what we know offset does. It moves everything straight up and straight down. That's it. It's, it's literally the simplest thing in the world. It basically moves the entire image brighter or darker. Now, when I do that same thing with the first node, so this is the node going into the color space transform, you'll see that it reacts slightly differently. 
see how it kind of bends from the middle. And even when I really, really press it up, it does get squished against the top, but it never really clips. Whereas if I go to the node after the color space transform and I push this up, it's gonna clip. So this is basically the most fundamental thing about understanding where your color space transform should go in your node graph, is just understanding that it's reacting to anything that's before it. For me, doing our primary adjustments before the color space transform has a much more natural feel. Again, it kind of emulates as if we had shot it that way in the first place. So we're kind of setting things up so that they're perfect to put into the color space transform rather than reacting to what's coming out of the color space transform. So then you might be saying, okay, perfect. So like, let's take our color space transform, throw it at the end, and we can throw a couple of nodes here. Maybe we can do exposure. We can do another node for contrast. We can do another node for balance. So we got our exposure right. Then like our contrast, we can just use our contrast slider a little bit and our balance. Let's warm this up a little bit. And that looks pretty good. So we've got before, then we've got what we wish we had shot it like, and then we've got our color space transform. And a lot of people do like to work this way where they just slap the color space transform right at the end and they never do anything after it. But I do think that there are some situations where you might want to have your color space transform and then do a few things afterwards. One reason that you might want to do certain things after the color space transform is because your tools are going to react in a way that actually feels like what you're doing on those tools. So let me explain here for a second. If we're looking at our custom curve here, I've got a node after the color space transform and one right before. So the one before technically is looking at this. This is everything up to the color space transform, but right before it, you can see that our graph here, everything that's happening in our image is kind of squared squished into the middle. Then we do our color space transform and we get this nice kind of stretched out image. So we can see that everything stretches right from kind of really high points all the way down to the bottom. Now, if we go to that one before the color space transform and we were to, let's say, want to bring up our blacks to get a little bit of that kind of faded look. So I'm gonna set a bit of an anchor point here and here, and then I'm gonna drag up my blacks on the curve. And for some reason, it's actually getting darker. And that's because our lowest, our deepest, darkest point is actually only going down to here and we're making that lower here. We're actually bringing down the exposure on that. Now, if we were to reset that and we were to go over to the node after the color space transform and do that same thing where we put a couple of anchor points and then we start dragging up the black, you see we're getting that faded black look. And that's because the image is already stretched out. So now my curves are actually responding kind of in the way that they feel like they should. Now, it's not to say that you couldn't get used to that way of working, and I know a lot of people do prefer to work that way, so I could take a look at my curves on the node before the color space transform, see that this is the darkest point that we're gonna hit, this is the brightest point that we're gonna hit, and then kind of treat any space in between there like my curve, so I can make my anchor there, and then I could bring this up to give that kind of similar faded look. And it is technically doing a very similar thing, but it does feel kind of weird to use the tools in that way. So it is kind of nice to have the option to use it after and treat the tool the way that you know it to be. So I want to be able to just create my fade by dragging up from the very bottom like that. Now, the other reason that you might wanna do certain things after your color space transform is if you have LUTs that you want to use or if you have certain tools that you want to use that are looking for a Rec. 709 input. So for example, I've got a LUT pack that you can get from my store and they're all designed to be used in Rec. 709. So if you apply them before the color space transform, they're gonna react slightly weirdly. They will still do something because they're going to be applying some kind of transformation, but they were designed in Rec. 709. So the idea would be that you would do the color space transform and then put the LUTs afterwards. So like, let's grab rabbit here, slap it on. That works pretty well. If we were to move that to before, it has a slightly different effect because instead of affecting this image, it's affecting this image. And as far as tools, so for example, I have a tool that I like to use called Film Convert. 
and you can technically choose a camera profile. So I could use this as my color space transform if I really wanted to. So I could do the full thing right at the end, but it's standard sRGB coming in is just looking for Rec. 709. So if I put this before, it does something really weird with it. If I put it after, now it looks like I've just put some film on it. We can change the film stock and so on and so forth. But the default here is looking for a Rec. 709 input as far as I'm aware. So it's important to know all of the LUTs and tools that you're trying to work with. What kind of input are they looking for? Do they want Rec. 709? Can they handle doing the log footage or do they want something like Cineon, something really specific? And the reason that I bring up Cineon is because the DaVinci Resolve film looks that a lot of people like to use, the LUTs that are built in, are actually looking for a Cineon film log input. So if we go to our LUTs up here, and then we go down to film looks. We've got all these different film looks. And if I were just to make a node after my color space transform and slap one of these on there, let's do the 2383 D65 slap that on there, you can see that doesn't look very good. If I were to just disable that for a second, and let's say instead of going from S gamma 3 Cine S log 3 to Rec. 709 gamma 2.4, I'm gonna change the output gamma, change that to Cine on film log, and now you can see it went a little bit more flat again, and then I'm going to apply that LUT afterwards, and now you can see that it's a lot better than what we had before gamma 2.4. So that looks a lot more usable than this did. This LUT is actually doing the conversion from Cineon gamma into Rec. 709 gamma 2.4. So it's doing it for you. So it kind of almost becomes part of our color space transform because it's doing the final step of our gamma conversion. So let's really quickly do a grade on this image and see what happens. So I'm gonna start with a single node. I'm gonna throw my color space transform on there. I'm gonna choose S gamut 3 Cine. I'm gonna choose S log 3, Rec. 709, gamma 2.4. All I'm doing to get down to them quickly is hitting the first letter on my keyboard and then it goes down real quick. Three nodes before. And I'm gonna do exactly what I did before. This one's gonna be exposure. This one's gonna be contrast. And this one's going to be balance. Exposure, I'm just gonna bring up a little bit and I'm watching my waveform down here to kind of see if uh, anything is worrisome. That looks pretty good. My contrast. I'm actually gonna use my curves this time to do a little bit of contrast. Again, I'm kind of keeping an eye on this waveform inside my curves uh, to be able to see what I'm affecting and what is actually happening. Because if I do a bunch of stuff down here, it's not really doing anything. There we go. So there's a little bit of extra contrast there. And I'm going to go to my balance. And again, I'm just going to kind of warm this up a little bit. Then I've got my color space transform and I'm going to create a couple of nodes afterwards. So let's say for this one, I want to add some kind of a little film fade type look. So I'm going to use this low soft to bring up the lows and use the high soft to kind of bring down those highs up here. And on the next one, maybe I want to add some kind of color contrast. So I'm going to go over to my hue versus hue. And I'm just going to create dots here by clicking on both my red and my cyan here. I'm going to move my blues a little bit over to cyan and move my greens a little bit towards yellow, yellows towards orange a little bit, just a hair, and my reds back towards orange as well. Anchor my oranges in the middle. And again, all of these tools are reacting the way I expect them to. All my blues, I don't have to worry about trying to read what's going on in this waveform down here because I just know I'm grabbing the blue slider, it's going to move blues. So this is before and after on that one. And then maybe just a little bit of a kind of teal in the shadows, orange in the highlights type of film look. I don't know that I really like that necessarily, but hopefully that gives you the idea. So basically these three are kind of like my look. These three are just for like my initial primary balance. And then if I wanted to add something like, let's say one of these film LUTs at the end, what I need to do is actually go color space transform. I'm gonna use another one. I'm gonna go from Rec. 709 gamma 2.4 because that's what we're currently in. And I'm gonna change my output gamma to Cineon film log. And then I'm gonna make another node and I'm going to pick one of these film looks to toss on there. 
kind of like this one. So double click that and it applied it to the selected node. So this is before the film look and after the film look. And a quick little tip if you want to use these film looks, one thing that I like to do is grab the color space transform that's going to Cineon as well as the LUT, right click, create compound node, and now I can just back off that by going into my key and bringing my key output down. So if I go 0.5, I've got half the amount of like how much that film look was doing. In this case, I've put the color space transform smack dab in the middle. Everything before it is primaries. Everything after it is kind of my look because the tools react in a way that I feel comfortable with. And then at the very end, I've got another color space transform just to use a LUT that needs to have a Cineon film log look into it. So that's a practical look at understanding how color space transform can help you in your color grading. And one way that you can use color space transforms that I didn't get to mention in that example is for matching clips from different cameras. As long as the color space transform tool has the right input gamma and color space, you should be able to get more accurate matching. But as always, I want to hear from you. Is there a way that you use color space transform that you think might be interesting to share? Leave a comment down below and on your way down there, make sure to hit that like and subscribe button, hit the bell notification so you don't miss out on future tutorials. Thank you so much for watching and I'll see you next time.